NTR. Goedenavond, welkom thuis. Welkom bij een nieuwe aflevering van College Tour. Onze gast van vanavond vluchtte als jong meisje samen met haar ouders uit Cuba... na de staatsgreep van Fidel Castro. Ze kwam terecht in Miami en daar werd ze verliefd op de bandleider van de Miami Sound Machine. En met hem schreef ze ongelooflijk veel hits. De Conga, Dr. Beat, Bad Boys, te veel om op te noemen. Zeven Grammys won ze en ze verkocht meer dan 100 miljoen platen. Maar er is nog één grote droom. Ze wil heel graag een keer live optreden in een bevrijd Cuba. Of dat gaat lukken, horen we vanavond. Samen met 300 studenten hier in Tivoli in Utrecht... interview ik de queen of Latin pop, Gloria Estefan. Dank u wel. Ah, your Dutch is, uh, is already... I'm learning good. interesting yeah. words. Because this is... Uh, we are in Utrecht, for a good reason, I would say, because one of your first gigs, maybe, was in the Netherlands, here in Utrecht. And the conga has roots in Utrecht. What's it, the story there? It was born here. It was inspired by a Dutch audience. We were playing in Club Cartouche. Right. Now it's called Stairway to Heaven, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, this must have been 84 or 85, something around that time. And we were promoting Dr. Beat, because we had a number one record in Holland. We were so happy. It was our first English language number one record in the world here. So we came and we did the show, and the audience was going, we want more, we want more. And I'm going, gee, we don't have any more. What do we do? <laughs> so Emilio Your brought, husband? yes, my husband Emilio, Who is here? brought his accordion w with us. And uh, he said, let's play all those really old Cuban congas that we used to play in the parties in Miami. And I go, but they don't speak Spanish. He goes, they speak Dutch, what difference does it make? And I go, okay, why not? So we played them and they went crazy for the music. So we were very sure that it was gonna be a success. And then we tried to talk the record company into releasing it and they said, it'll never work. It's too Latin for the Americans and too American for the Latins. How wrong they were. Okay, it's perfect then. It's your biggest number one hit, I yes, think. Yes, it is. Still and gets is it, played. Is it true that there is a hidden message in the song? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, if you play the song backwards, it's supposed to make you want to go hit Fidel Castro with a pair of maracas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Don't play yeah, it backwards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk about him. He died in November last year, so that's maybe a, a very good day for you. I don't know. No, the death of anyone is never a good day. Mm. I don't think that that's... I tried to convince him to go on vacation. I wrote a song called Go Away, uh. <laughs> which he also didn't pay attention to. Let's go back to your student years. Okay. <laughs> What kind of student was Gloria Estefan when we are talking, for example, about sex, drugs and rock and roll? Were you wild? Oh, no. No. I wish. Maybe I would have had a little more experience. He was my first and only boyfriend, by the way, Emilio. By coincidence, it wasn't planned. Uh, no, I was a very good student. I, I really loved learning. My mother had a PhD in education from mm -hmm. Cuba, so education was very important. I was going to be a psychologist. I had two majors, psychology and communications, and a French minor. And uh, I had three jobs at the same time as I was going to school full time. Oh, thanks for that picture. Yeah. Oh no, that's my graduation yeah. picture from high school. Oh yeah. Ooh. Is it? Is it? <laughs> oh, not pretty. Is it true, Emilio, that when you first met, that you have said this is a famous line? I think we have to change 95% of you. Yes. Is, is that what you said to Gloria? Well, not exactly. Oh, yes, it is exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Listen, I knew that he had Did he think a... that you were ugly then? Or what was I, wrong? I asked him, what 5% are you dating me for? <laughs> <laughs> It was about personality. I mean, she was a very shy person. Uh -huh. And uh, she was, uh, I think, because her childhood was not good. There was a lot of problems, you know, with her father and, you know, being mature, being a, a little girl. 
And I said, you have to improve like 95. But to me, it was, was about being happy. And, you know, and uh, it took a long time. What I, was, why were you unhappy at the time? Uh, well, my father was very ill. Mm. I had a lot of responsibilities. I couldn't do anything other than come home from school and take care of him. And uh, it was, it was, he was really ill. And Your father I fought in the Vietnam War and he came back sick. Yes, Agent Orange poisoning yeah. from, from Vietnam. And you were basically his nurse. Yes, I was. And I took care of my little sister because my mother was working full time. And then she would come back and go to school, to the university, to be able to get her teaching credentials uh -huh. revalidated. Because the day we left Cuba, they only let us take one suitcase. And she brought her diploma. And at the airport, they told her, you're not taking your education if you're leaving. And they ripped the diploma, which is stupid because your education is here and here, not in a, mm. pe a piece of paper. Well, let's have a look at uh, the story at the time told by a correspondent for the Dutch uh, media okay. who's working in the area. Op uitbundige wijze verwelkomde de Cubaanse hoofdstad Havana in 1952 zijn nieuwe president, Fulgencio Batista. Fulgencio Batista, dat was een, een dictator. Uh, het was ook een corrupte leider in Cuba. Op 1 januari 1959 was Fidel Castro de baas. En je ziet dat in de tijd vlak daarna heel veel aanhangers van Batista het land hebben verlaten. Ook de familie van, van Gloria Estefan is toen Cuba uitgevlucht naar Miami. In de beginjaren was Miami echt het bolwerk van de Castro-haters, van het verzet tegen uh, Castro. Dat is het nog steeds. Viva Cuba Libre! Viva Estados Unidos Libre! Viva! En dames de Blanco, dat, dat is gewoon de, de bekendste dissidentenbeweging uh, van Cuba. Er zijn eigenlijk in de geschiedenis uh, van het Castro-regime vrijwel nooit grote uh, publieke demonstraties tegen het regime geweest. Dus dat, uh, ja, dat trok de aandacht. In 2005 kregen ze de Sacharov-prijs van het Europese parlement. In 2010 uh, organiseerde uh, Gloria Estefan... Uh, in Miami een gigantische demonstratie om die dames uh, in het wit, de dames de Blanco, te steunen. Uh, 10.000 mensen op de been gekregen. This is a big message to all of them that freedom is alive. Nou, Gloria Estefan heeft altijd gezegd dat ze wil zingen in een, in, in een vrij Cuba. Uh, het hangt natuurlijk heel erg af van wat je definitie van een vrij Cuba is. Ik denk dat de definitie van mevrouw Estefan uh, uh, betekent dat het echt helemaal anders is, dat, dat, dat er niks meer over is van het Castro-regime. Nou, dat. Lijkt mij uh, heel moeilijk voor te stellen dat ze dat nog gaat meemaken. I agree with that last statement. Why do you think you will never go back and sing live in Cuba? Because I don't think that I don't see any any uh, hints that this regime is is going away. They already have their children in place behind the scenes, and uh, they're not letting go of power. I can't see that happening and. The people of Cuba would have to revolt, and it's very difficult for them, because as you saw, Damas de Blanco, which we know them, they would go out on Sundays, no yelling, nothing, just carrying their pictures and a flower. And they were getting beaten by the Cuban government. And it got to a point where I thought, I have to say something to bring attention to these ladies so they don't feel they're alone, mm -hmm. and so that they know that there are people supporting them from even outside in, in the Cuban exile community. And that march, the official numbers were one thing, but the police told us there were 200,000 people right. in that march. What do you think if we would go out on the street in Havana and ask people about Gloria Estefan, what would they say to us? I think now they might know more who I am at the beginning. Don't say anything, we did this. Oh, you did that? Yes, we went to Cuba and we asked oh, people good. there. Oh, I want to see this. Have a look. Okay. Bueno, hasta donde sé es una cantautora eh, cubana arraigada en los Estados Unidos. La primera vez que oí de ella fue en 1985, con la conga de Miami Sound Machine, que de momento se volvió un hit en todo el país. Después, bueno, vienen los años. La cuestión es que eh, Gloria Estefan no se transmite su música, no se transmite en la, la radio y la televisión oficial en Cuba. La conocemos porque, bueno, los cubanos nos agenciamos muchas maneras de ver lo que no nos... Lo que no nos muestran, pero yo la vi, por ejemplo, en el concierto en el homenaje a Celia. La vi. El público cubano, a pesar de no haber podido disfrutarla, como dije anteriormente, directamente de ella, eh, sí, 90% de la población en Cuba conoce que, que Lori Estefan es, es un, un, un ícono, es, es un ícono para los cubanos. En cuanto a si ella pudiera cantar en Cuba, ¿qué tú piensas que pasaría en Cuba? Oh. 
Pienso que sería un, un super éxito, incluso mucho mayor que los Rolling Stones y los que, los que han venido últimamente. porque Sería una cosa multitudinaria. Habría, no sé, la Plaza de la Revolución, algo más grande así para poder llenarla. That's beautiful. Very nice to know. But let's picture this, La Plaza de Revolución. I don't know if that's even possible for you because you are in exile, you are a refugee, but let's see you on that square while you have these two images there of Che Guevara and Fidel watching you. That's why you won't see me on that square. Can you picture yourself no. singing there? I can't picture myself for many reasons. Number one, I'm very happy that people travel to Cuba. I'm happy mm. and I hope it happens more. But me, I'm Cuban, and the fact that the Castros have created second-class citizens out of their own people in Cuba, and me as an exile could enjoy any beach, any restaurant, any place, but the Cubans that live there cannot. I can't sing the words from Oye Mi Canto that talks about freedom of expression when the people that are in front of me cannot express themselves in a free manner without paying the price, ultimately. And uh, it, it would be, that's why I haven't gone. Juan has invited me when he went. The Stones invited us. They called Emilio and I told them, look, go, it's great. I'm glad you're making huh. the people happy. But for me, it's a very different story. And it will never happen in your lifetime. Ne probably not if they're still around. And I'm getting old now, so you know. <laughs> Over there. Hi, Gloria. Hello. You, you hear a lot about you, about that you want a free Cuba, but what do you define as a free Cuba? Okay, to me, a free Cuba, a free any country, means a place where the people can elect legitimately their leader, where people and journalists can speak openly without fear of reprisal or jail or anything of that nature, where people can choose the religion they want to, you know, uh, be and, and be able to openly um, enjoy it and where we have the freedoms that we enjoy in most parts of the world. And as a Cuban, I, th I feel even more appreciative of the freedoms that we have in the United States because we lost ours and a whole generation left, had to leave because they couldn't survive there and you know things were made very difficult. And my father took me out so I could grow in freedom, hoping to go back because that was his plan. I still have my round trip ticket going back to Cuba from Pan Am, which doesn't exist anymore. No. So Seriously? You still yeah, have that? I still have it, yeah. Huh. Have it. Yeah. They thought it would be a matter of months. It's been a long time. That's what many refugees think all over the world, right? Oh, like yes. people from Syria who are coming to exactly. the Netherlands, they maybe hope they can go back and money will be stuck in another country. Yeah, and it's very tough because, you know, you have to... Now, I'm already assimilated. I was a baby when I came, but what my parents had to go through was difficult. Mm. Do we take freedom for granted, those people who are not coming from a country where they have been chased out of? I know for a fact that the United States, a lot of people that have been in the United States for generations take those freedoms for granted. They think that they can't be lost, and you can. Mm. Those freedoms can be lost in a moment if you take your eye off the ball. Here you go. I'm wondering what uh, got you through all the difficult times in your life? Music. Music. Yes. Okay. Um, it was my escape. I didn't have to sing for other people. I would lock myself in my room because I wanted to be strong for my mother and I didn't want her to see, you know, cracks in the armor. So I would grab my guitar and learn songs that moved me and I would sit and just cry and let it all out. And I sing since I talk. So it, both for me and Emilio, music has been a very healing thing and it continues to be. In and also way. to your accident. Yes, after my accident, very much because... You had an accident in 1990 yes. with uh, your tour bus, and uh, yes. you came out with... I was paralyzed. I was, paralyzed, yeah. My spinal cord was... Uh, my back was broken. Wow. And uh, the doctors think it's pretty much a miracle, but I felt everyone's prayers and to each other. also the believing in God? I, I believe in God. I don't believe... Uh, I, I'm not dogmatic. I was raised Catholic, which kind of makes me irreverent. <laughs> So I don't follow any specific religion, but I do believe very much in spirituality and in the connection that we all share. I believe that religion is a manifestation of the spirituality with each of our different cultures, because basically it's all about respect wow. and treating others as you would want to be treated. That's the basic rule. If you do that, then we're not going to do any wrong ever. Respect for you. 
Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> do you ever cry? Do I cry? Mm -hmm. I have cried more in the last three years than in my whole life watching this show because we've had to dig deep to prepare the musical. Right. And you really On your feet, that's the reason why you're here in the yes, Netherlands. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then this year also I lost my mom, June mm -hmm. 13th, and that was tough. Yeah. Let's have a look at your sister, whom we talked to. I was born in the United States. Uh, my sister was born in Cuba, but we were raised in a family that was strictly Cuban. We spoke strictly Spanish in the house, and I think it, it really helped to cement our Cuban uh, heritage and, and to make us feel that we were more Cuban-American than American-Cuban. We've always been passionate about a free Cuba. And that's what we were raised to, to want, and that's what we were raised to believe. Our condolences go out tonight to the Estefan family. Gloria Estefan's mother has passed away. That was a tough one. Um, my mother was definitely the center of our lives, and my sister and I spent 33 days at her bedside in intensive care, um, expecting her to recover and not expecting to have to bury her in the end. But the 33 days, just the three of us there, really did something special to our bond as sisters, absolutely. Masur, I love you with all my heart. Oh, I can't do it without getting emotional. I am so proud of what you've done, and I love you to the moon and back. Oh, you wanna kill me? <laughs> oh my gosh, my sister. We're very close. How big is the influence? Uh, don't look at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard enough to keep control. I see you crying now, I can't take it. Oh. <laughs> Where's the Kleenex? Yeah, 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 there he's standing there, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Give me that box, please. <laughs> oh, Lordy. <laughs> oh. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah, no, you're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you did it on purpose. <laughs> uh. Well. <clears throat> Uh, like Barbara Walters, uh, making everybody cry. <laughs> luckily, nobody knows here who she is. Yeah, but... luckily. She makes everybody cry in the interviews. Always. Always. Yeah. The question is, naturally, how important was your mom for you? Oh, my gosh. She was mom and father, both. Because my dad got sick. He was 34 when he got ill. Mm. My mom was three years older than him. Uh, he died at 47. And in between all that time, which was, you know, from the time I was like 11, 12 years old till he went to the hospital and then eventually died. My mom was all we had. But is it true that she opposed your career and in the beginning your relationship? She did. Well, she gave him a hard time. Oh my God, so, so hard. She slammed the door in his face. Why? I think, I mean, in retrospect, she was afraid. Uh, she was raising two daughters alone. Hmm. This musician dude comes out of nowhere he takes her daughter, who was studying psychology, and invites her to be in a band. And then it wasn't until after my accident that she realized how much he loved me and that he loved me for me and that it had nothing to do with the fact that I was the singer in his band or, mm. or anything of that nature. We, you know, so in the years scared. in between, did you talk? Did you... Yeah, yeah, we talked except for two years that uh, I, my sister, when my father died, finally, she really started messing up in school, you know, not going to classes and hanging out with the wrong people. And I was always like my sister's mother. Hmm. I was touring the world. I, I was concerned about my sister. So I wanted to take her on the road with me. And when I told my mother, oh my gosh, she hit the ceiling because she goes, well, you're gone. My, my grandson's gone, he's gone. And now you're gonna take Rebecca and I go, Mom, I'm doing it for her, her own good. But she just got so upset. She said, if you take Rebecca, I'm not talking to you anymore. I go, we'll be here the minute you want to talk. And I would keep calling her. And, mm -hmm. But she, it was before cell phones, so it was easy mm -hmm. for her not to answer the phone and to make a point. Yeah. My mom was very, very stubborn. And to make a point, she didn't. And then I had that accident. And the first thing she saw, 
She was a teacher. She was the union representative of her school. She was in the teacher's lounge, and on the bottom it said, Gloria Stefan dead in bus crash. And she collapsed. And then two minutes later, her best friend ran in and said, don't, don't pay attention, she's not dead, she's very injured, but she's alive, she's alive. So the first time we talked in two years when she got to the hospital at three o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and I remember she, I grabbed her hand, and I said, oh my God, I didn't remember how tiny your hands were. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Nothing else was ever said mm -hmm. about the two years. <laughs> like if nothing had happened. happened. Yeah. Questions here in the audience, please stand up and ask your questions to Gloria Estefan. Here you go. Yeah, um, well, you sing both in English and Spanish. And I was wondering if you approach these languages differently and which one you prefer to sing in. That's a great question. And yes, uh, completely differently. Uh, in English, when I write, I have to control my passion and my sweetness because then they accuse you of being saccharine if you're too sweet. No such thing in Spanish. You can't be too sweet, <laughs> too passionate, too over the top when you talk about love. So the love songs I absolutely love to do in Spanish. I also love the rhythmic things like Mi Tierra. I love to perform. It was my first language. It was the first, anything I sang was in Spanish at first. So that is off the language of my heart and English is the language of my head. There is a Dutch musician who's now very successful in the United States and he lives near you, very near you. Really? Rolf Sanchez, here he oh is. Oh my gosh. Alles wat nu Latin is, komt, komt gewoon door Emilio en door Gloria. Dat, dat, dat is gewoon wereldwijd succesvol geworden door hun. En alles wat er nu is, dan hoor je een stukje van hun terug. Dat is nog het mooiste ervan. Ik denk oprecht dat een Shakira en Jennifer Lopez dat zeker als voorbeeld hebben gebruikt. Sowieso heeft ze voor hun doorbraak gezorgd. Haar grote succes van Jennifer Lopez was Let's Get Loud. En het, en de, het allereerste en grootste succes van, van Shakira, Whenever Whenever, heeft ze ook geschreven. Zij heeft alle deuren geopend voor alle Latin artiesten. Dat is echt letterlijk wat er is gebeurd. Conga. Conga, con... Ja, conga. Dr. Beat, ja. One, two, three, kent ook iedereen. Mijn lievelingsliedje van, van haar is Si Voy a Perderte. Uh, ze heeft hem ook in het Engels gezongen. In het Spaans gaat hij Si Voy a Perderte ja. Alles wat zij, eigenlijk alles wat zij gedaan heeft, niet Tierra, dat is niet normaal. Het gaat over hoe mooi Cuba is en hoe ze dat mist. Het zit in haar bloed en uh, ze, zal het, ze zal er altijd uh, aan terugdenken. Ik woon nu in Miami en hoe er naar Gloria en, en, en Emilio wordt, wordt gekeken is gewoon... ...zij zijn de allergrootste bazen. Zeg maar, als je het hebt over een kartel of zo, dan zijn zij daar, zeg maar. Je moet daar komen om vervolgens uh, succesvol te kunnen worden. Ik denk dat zij gewoon de queen en de... En de king zijn van Miami. Wauw. Mm. Ja. That's quite something, the king and the queen of Miami. And the, the conga queen. The conga queen and the Cuban cartel. You know, it's interesting that he brought up that song, Si Voy a Perderte, because the question that you asked about approaching a song in different languages. In English, that song is called, I Don't Want to Lose You Now. Mm -hmm. In it means, you know, uh, obviously I don't want to lose you in Spanish. Si voy a perderte, que sea por vez final, meaning, if I lose you this time, you're out of here, buddy. <laughs> so it's like, you see the two different types of, uh, of attitudes. Very feisty Spanish. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know, we're blessed to, Miami is our home, and we were always wanting to be involved in the business of it because we wanted to be a part of the growth of Miami, and we've had that good fortune to be able to do that. We diversified into uh, real estate and we have a couple of hotels and like seven restaurants now, I think, or something like that. Because I always know that especially women in the entertainment business, we have a shorter shelf life mm. than the men, you know? Look at the Rolling Stones. He's out there doing his thing. They're in their 70s. 
I don't know if I can be doing the conga in my 70s. Yeah. Or want to. Tina Turner was uh, doing well. Yeah, you know what? All day. And I admire that, but I think everything in life has a moment, and uh -huh. we've had such great moments. Madonna is still playing, and I know that you, you, you met at least once. I read no, no, that no, somewhere. Yeah, we, many times. We've many times. She puts on a great show. Still. Yeah, oh yeah. But my God, it, like, she probably doesn't eat anything. I can help. <laughs> I spent most of my years being really disciplined. I want to have a little fun before I go. You know right, I mean? right, right. Yeah. I, I know that when, um, after the accident, uh, you were longing for a second child, which yes. came, and, and you had a beautiful daughter. Yes. And then you were, uh, I read somewhere that you were having dinner with Madonna, and she wanted to have a kid as yes, well. Yes, she and came you with gave, Carlos. you gave her advice. Uh, yeah, kind of. What was it? <laughs> Stand on your head. Why? After sex. <laughs> You know, so it all stays where it's supposed to be. <laughs> Better chance, right? <laughs> you know, this is a show in which people ask for advice, so we yeah, had to exactly. get that piece of advice is, I yeah, think, important yeah. for some of them here. I got that advice, actually, from the wife of a famous musician in England, so I just passed on the ah, advice. Here you I go. didn't make it up. <laughs> so you are here in, uh, in Utrecht, naturally, for your musical. Yes. How important is this musical for you, and how difficult was it to go back in your life and, and relive it all again? Um, it was difficult to find what story to tell uh -huh. because obviously Emilio and I are still alive and doing things. So you want to try to, why, you know, because why are we going to do something like that? And the only reason for us to do it would be like through our music to try to inspire people that when they go see the show, they maybe remember some things, maybe just be entertained if that's all you want. But also the situation with my mom, those two years, Maybe they're going through something with a family member and you remind them, hey, life is short. Don't waste your time on those things that don't have meaning or, you know, aren't important. Like? Uh, like what kind of things? Like, like not talking to, like, not trying to make a point so much that you break off a relationship. You know, the, the, it's just such a waste of time. Isn't that crazy? Because it's happening in so many families that people don't talk to each other for a minor thing. That exactly, happens. and it's, it's, it's really ridiculous. We talked to members of the cast and the director. Have a look. Oh, boy. Uh, my dad was uh, Gloria Fajardo and Jose Fajardo, Gloria's parents' neighbor in Havana. He lived downstairs. And um, the story that we share a lot is when uh, Gloria Fajardo's water broke to give birth to Gloria, my dad was, was present for that splash of her entrance into this world. <laughs> The verhaal van On Your Feet gaat over het leven van Gloria and Emilio Estefan. En dat begint eigenlijk bij dat je Gloria als klein meisje ziet. En je ziet haar opgroeien en, en um, Emilio ontmoeten. Je ziet hun carrière, hun, hun, hun liefde die ontstaat. En het verhaal eindigt bij uh, wanneer Gloria het heftige ongeluk heeft gekregen. En daardoor in een rolstoel belandt. Hier, I think the most dramatic moment in the musical is the bus crash. For me personally, the most dramatic moment in the musical is, is Cuba Libre, let's say in the States, because I'm looking at 29 Hispanic uh, actors and singers, you know, really singing something that's really personal to them. So it, I think it carries a different weight uh, over there. Um, here, they, you know, they've had to personalize it in a, in a very different way as to what that, that expression means to them. So you get the same authenticity, um, it's just, it just, it just varies just a little depending on who it is that's singing it. Andy, it's true. Yep. His father was there when my water broke. <clears throat> Can you imagine now he's the assistant director of our play? I didn't hire him, it just happened. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, the two main characters in the Netherlands, they are not uh, Latin actors. That is no. bug you that they did, couldn't find anybody who maybe could more relay what's the passion of Cuba or? Well, the, that's not the central focus of the story, right. the passion of Cuba. It's a, it's a love story, mm. first of all. A love story between Emilio and me, a love story to music, and a love story to the two countries that are important to us, the country of birth and the country I grew up in. I think any human being can identify with that. Here you go. <clears throat> Hi. Hello. My mother is Cuban, I'm Cuban. My question is, the life uh, back then with the regime of Batista wasn't very good. Okay, there was a democracy, a little freedom, but not really good. Then with Fidel Castro, they lost their freedom, but life 
went a little better, like with the family with, of my mother. So how do you look at that? Well, undoubtedly, dictatorship is bad regardless. So even though I wasn't there, I've done a lot of studying about what happened with Batista and, and the whole history there. The difference is that before in Cuba, there was poverty, but now everybody's poor. Cuba was the fourth largest economy in Latin America in, early, in late 1940s and early 1950s. We were players on the world stage, and uh, it's just a shame that it all went to hell in a handbasket. Fidel had the opportunity to do the right thing, but because he didn't want to let go of power, he took over things that he had no idea how to do, and the economy went down and things so no yeah of course it wasn't good what batista did either over there okay uh hello my name is lina and i'm making a master in latin american studies here oh. so i was wondering if you have the chance to study the same master as as making what would you what would you like to study uh, as a research for the thesis you know what i i noticed very much that Maybe it's a human condition. Everything is a pendulum swing. And especially in Latin America, you always tend to swing extreme right, extreme left. We're even seeing it in the United States now. Mm. I, would, I would probably be really interested to find out why it is that even though the majority of people are in the middle, somehow power always ends up in the hands of one extreme or the other. So that's a really interesting observation, I think. Do you know why people swing from extreme left to extreme, extreme right? I think they're the loudest. You know, people that are in the middle, that are moderate, that are accepting, that are, you know, uh, accepting of different ways and different opinions, mm -hmm. generally don't stand up and go, hey, you know, like they don't fight about it. The silent majority. Exactly. But the extreme left and the extreme right, they're in your face, you know, like trying to push the agenda. So that's just one small observation, but it's got to be very much more complex. Than but that. your question is interesting because it leads to another subject. Uh, you already got all these prizes. You had uh, seven Grammys, the Presidential Medal of Freedom that was given to you by President Obama. Obama, yes. Yep. It sounds like you're still in love with him. Yes. <laughs> I actually spoke to him. He called my cell phone. When? Like uh, Why? two weeks ago, uh, to invite me to be a part of his uh, Obama Foundation. They are bringing for three days students and students that uh, make social change in their in different countries from all over the world to a summit to talk to leaders, world leaders, to teach them how to better make social change. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, they're having a concert and President Obama invited me to, to be a part of it. So I told them, we miss you. <laughs> I miss you. Well, it's interesting that you are mentioning this because you also get the uh, Kennedy Honors, a really impressive award. Normally, the president hands out these, these great well, they, awards. They, just, uh, they, they, they have a dinner. Attend. They, they attend. attend, there yeah, is a dinner, yeah. and then something went wrong because this is in December and this is what happened with President Trump. The White House announcing on Saturday that the president and first lady would be skipping the annual Kennedy Center honors in part because they didn't want to be a distraction from the honorees. Uh, certainly not an unprecedented move by this president. What is unprecedented is the amount of criticism that he has received from several of the honorees, Lionel Richie, Norman Lear and Carmen de la Levade, all of them deciding to skip a reception at the White House that is often held before the Kennedy Center honors gala. And I appreciate that, that the president did that, actually. Why? I do. Because everyone that's getting this award has spent a lifetime doing what we do, and then to get this kind of honor and have it be second fiddle to politics mm -hmm. is not fun. And as you know, I'm sure everybody's been following the news, it's a very controversial presidency and it would overshadow the award. So I, I am appreciative that, that he made that move. What would you have said to him, maybe not from the stage, but in a private moment, if, if the one moment occurs, what would you have said to President Trump? I would say, uh, President Trump, look, immigrants are good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> we contribute, we contribute, we contribute. 
we add to the tapestry of colors that is our great country, the United States. A couple of more questions before we let you go. Here you go. Yeah, I would like to ask you the question in Spanish, okay. but probably the rest of the people won't understand me, so. I'll translate for I you, okay. go ahead. I and the rest of my colleagues, we were wondering about the song, Mi Tierra, that we, as a Spanish speaker, we identify with the song very much, but we were wondering what is exactly your feeling, where does the, the lyric came from, and uh, since you were two years when you left Cuba. So we were really wondering about that. Okay, that was in Spanish, by the way. No, 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 but then I said, You speak perfect English. You speak perfect English. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because that's why we made that song. That song is supposed to be for anyone that is outside of their country that feels the longing, the missing, the smells, the sights. And the reason we were able to do that, even though I left when I was two, is because Cuba was alive in my home. My mother made it incredibly you know, important every day of my life. They brought us as a seed to American soil, but she watered me with Cuban water hmm. and she poured Cuban sun on me. But it's not supposed to be a Cuban experience. It's supposed to be a human experience from a person that travels to another place and misses their homeland. Do you know the song by heart? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, all, I all hear it every time. You are here I'm with sure. colleagues, he said. Could, could, yeah, we are here with colleagues. Because I know because uh, that can. there are many people here who, who love that song. I do as well. Yeah. And I heard it. Obama loves it too. Oh, <laughs> here you go. He does, he, he would dance with his girls. With really? His, when they were babies, he would dance to Mi Tierra. It's beautiful, but could you sing it? Oh, I don't have a... She's not a singer? <laughs> ...voice, so probably somebody else can sing De mi tierra I... bella, pa pum pum. De mi tierra santa, pa pum pum. Oigo ese grito de los tambores y los timbales al cumbancha. Ese pregón que canta un hermano que de su tierra vive lejano y que recuerdo la hace llorar. Una canción que vive entonando de su dolor, de su propio llanto y se le escucha penar. There you go. Yeah. Free concert. Thank you so much. You, you sang that song on uh, Guantanamo Bay, I, I think, did. in 1995. The oh, only so time you went back to Cuba because that's the one part where well, there is a prison there. It's a terrible place, but you did a concert there. It's it's well, it was soil. The, it's, it was the army base, and yeah. they had 45,000 Cubans that had tried to leave Cuba, and got locked in there while they were being processed. So yes, I went in, it was my birthday and they all sang me happy birthday. And when I went to sing Mi Tierra, oh my God, I had a knot in my throat because I was looking at the fence, dividing, you know, uh, the base from, and there were Cubans standing on the fence listening and I kept wishing, oh my God, I'm on Cuban soil, but I'm not, and I'm singing this, but in Cuba, but I'm not. It was- uh, mm, Confusing. It, well, it was, it was, yeah, it was emotionally- We have the clip here. This difficult. is part of the concert. <laughs> Well, was, this is Guantanamera, also yes. a superb song. Because it's Guantanamo. Because it's about the, No, and I improvised the, the lyric of that. What was saying was, I left very young Cuba, but what you can never take away from me is my identity. I'm mm. Cuban. So, yeah, that's what I sang to them there. Yeah. Over there. Is there any decision in your career you would do different when you look back at it now? The one thing that I regret a lot is that, you know, I didn't like being the center of attention. So it was very difficult for me to stand on a stage and look out over a million faces. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is look above the million faces mm -hmm. to be able to get past that moment, my nerves, whatever was happening. And the most incredible part of being a musician or a singer or a performer is the connection that you make with the people and looking into people's eyes and being able to recognize at that moment when you're sharing your music, 
I would have done it a lot sooner than, than yeah. I did. And I also wouldn't worry so much mm. about everything being perfect. Or, you know, I, I, I would just let it go. Like, it took me a while to get to that point in my career to just relax on the stage and, and just do my thing and do the music and let people see how I felt about it. So mm. that's one thing I would change. Great advice. Yes. Last question here. Hello. Uh, hola. Hola. Gloria. Hola, como esta? Uh, like Celia say, my English is not very good looking. <laughs> I love <Yeah>. that. <laughs> I need you. Dale, dale, español. Una pregunta de la migración. Eh, estamos en la, los tiempos de la migración y yo quiero saber tu opinión de lo que estamos viviendo ahora y en tu experiencia, eh, tu mejor consejo para los que somos inmigrantes. People go looking for a better life, better opportunities, usually for their children. In my father's case, it was freedom because he knew what was going to happen in Cuba and I thank him for having taken those steps. My only advice is prepare, like before you go somewhere, uh, learn what you'll be able to do there, what you're gonna have to do there, what kind of jobs you're gonna have to be able to take. Um, try to go the legal way, obviously, because that's always much better in an organized way. It's tough because as time goes by, more countries are becoming more strict about those rules. But if you have to go, you, gotta, you have to go. I mean, you know what I, what I hoped for this week? I keep hoping that an alien spaceship will come down into the world because when that happens, we're gonna start seeing each other as humans and you know, knowing that we are the same and seeing more our similarities because something from the outside will make us all of a sudden feel as one. And uh, I know that our borders separate us and sometimes our ideologies, sometimes our religion, you know, cultures. But basically, we are all human beings that love, live, eat, sleep. We're all the same. It's, there's no difference. We may have different beliefs, but that's beautiful too. We always end this show with um, the one question we ask every guest. What is the best advice you can give to the students here and the people who are watching our conversation at home? Do your best work. Realize that this is going to go by very fast and that the years that you're living now and the preparation that you are making to enter the world, you're going to need more preparation than I needed because now the jobs are harder. So if you can stay in school and study a higher degree, do it because things are very competitive out there. But enjoy it too. Learning is an amazing thing. And figure out what your passion is, what makes you happy. Because if you're happy doing your job, whether or not you make huge amounts of money or not, you're going to spend most of the hours of the day doing something you enjoy. Gloria Stefan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Before I let you go, this is also called Volgende Week. Spiegeltje, spiegeltje aan de wand. Wie is de mooiste taart van het land? En dan zegt die spiegel, dan ben jij jou. Oh. Dat is onze gast volgende week. Ja, hij is een comedian van de Netherlands. Je would love to see it. André van Duin, uh, te gast in College Tour voor deze week. Thuis bedankt voor het kijken. Jullie ontzettend bedankt voor jullie mooie vragen. En Gloria, thank you so much for coming out. And this is really Lee Chera from. Uh, Guantanamo Bay. Yes. There you go. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> Thanks again. That was great. NTR, speciaal voor iedereen.